Mrs. Harper. We have the antibiotic the doctor ordered. It's penicillin. Do you remember having this before? Yes, once when I had dental work done. Okay. Do you remember having any problems with it at all? No, I don't remember. I only took it that once. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and drip this through your IV, but I want you to let me know if you have any problems breathing or feel like you're itching or maybe even a lump in your throat. And then I'll be back in to check on you. Okay. Mrs. Harper, here's lunch. Need anything else? No, I'm fine. My nose is itchy. I'm hot. What's wrong? Yes? I need help. Trouble breathing. Lori, Mrs. Harper in 212 needs you stat. She's having trouble breathing. Mrs. Harper, what's happening? Are you choking? Hard breathing. You feel like you have a lump in your throat. Yes. And you're itching. Do your yes. eyes itch a lot? Yes. Okay, let me see your face. Okay. Mrs. Harper is experiencing symptoms suggestive of an anaphylactic reaction, probably related to the administration of penicillin. If unrecognized and untreated, anaphylaxis can cause death in a matter of minutes. Anaphylaxis is an allergic reaction that occurs in response to contact with a foreign substance, an antigen, to which the person has had a previous exposure. The body's normal immune response to an antigen is to develop an antibody known as IgG that will then protect the person from further adverse response to the antigen. However, in some individuals, exposure to certain antigens will stimulate production of another type of antibody, IgE. It is the presence of this antibody that will trigger the anaphylactic response when the person is next exposed to the antigen. Many antigens have been shown to produce IgE. These include drugs such as penicillin, hormones such as insulin, enzymes such as chymotrypsin, or streptokinase, proteins such as serum albumin and various blood products, venom from ants, bees, wasps, or snakes, animal dander, and foods such as eggs, milk, shellfish, and nuts. Recently, natural rubber or latex, as found in surgical gloves and products sterilized with ethylene oxide gas, have also been shown to be potentially allergenic. Once a person has been exposed to one of these antigens and has developed IgE antibody towards it, a repeated exposure can initiate an anaphylactic response. After penetrating the body's external environment, the antigen attaches to the IgE antibody on the surface of either a mast cell or a basophil. This interaction induces changes in the cell membrane and causes the release of several chemicals, histamine, slow-reacting substance of anaphylaxis, SRSA, and leukotriene. These chemicals cause the body changes that are reflected in the anaphylactic reaction. The leukotriene action is the most life-threatening. It causes constriction in the bronchioles that lead to the ineffective breathing patterns commonly seen. The histamine acts on capillary blood vessels to cause vasodilatation and capillary leaking. These actions lead to loss of fluid from the vascular bed into the tissues of the skin, upper airway, and gastrointestinal tract. It also causes urticaria or hives. Other antigens can cause a similar response to the anaphylactic reaction just described. However, they attach directly to the mast cells and basophils without the need for the IgE as an intermediary. This type of response is known as an anaphylactoid reaction. It produces effects in the body that are identical to anaphylaxis because the same chemical mediators are released from the mast cells and basophils. Antigens that have been implicated in an anaphylactoid reaction include contrast agents used in radiography, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, opiates, muscle relactants such as succinylcholine and detubocurarine sulfites, and mannitol. Because the body's response in either an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction is the same, the same criteria are used when assessing a patient at risk for either. As seen in Mrs. Harper's reaction, a short period of nasal, eye, and genital itching or burning may be the initial response. This is quickly followed by urticaria and angioedema. The patient may complain of feeling hot and may exhibit a rash. Minor symptoms of hoarseness, cough, dyspnea, and chest tightness may be quickly followed by laryngospasm 
and bronchospasm which can lead to sudden death. Hypotension resulting from the shifting of fluid into the tissues is evidenced by dizziness, syncope, and confusion. The blood pressure may drop 20 to 30 millimeters of pressure in a short time. Gastrointestinal symptoms of abdominal cramping, diarrhea, and vomiting are often present. Prompt intervention is needed when a patient appears to be having an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction. If the patient is still receiving the substance suspected of causing the reaction, the drug must be stopped immediately. A tourniquet is placed proximal to the IV site to reduce the amount of drug reaching the general circulation. I need a cross cut stat. It's okay, we're just going to get something in here. To the caregiver who is alone will need to call for assistance as the patient cannot be left unattended. The crash cart with emergency drugs and equipment will be needed and the physician notified. The patient is positioned, usually sitting, to facilitate breathing and is reassured that breathing assistance will be provided. To aid the patient's oxygen levels, oxygen may be given by nasal cannula at 4 to 6 liters per minute. Additional equipment to perform either a tracheotomy or endotracheal intubation should be available for the physician's use if the patient's airway status becomes critical. The physician usually orders epinephrine to counteract the effects of the anaphylactic reaction. This is usually given to the patient subcutaneously. The dose is 0.3 to 0.5 milliliters of a 1 to 1,000 dilution. This dose may be repeated in 20 minutes if the patient's condition has not improved. Epinephrine has several important actions to restore the patient's physiological changes to normal. It acts by attaching to receptors on mast cells and basophils and stabilizes the membrane, thus preventing further release of chemicals from the cells. It also can attach to receptors in the smooth muscle of the bronchi and cause relaxation, thus improving airflow through the respiratory membranes. It also will reduce edema in this area. When multiple doses of epinephrine are needed, the patient must be closely observed for acute hypertension and cardiac dysrhythmias, the most common of which is tachycardia. As soon as possible, another IV site needs to be established for use for drug and fluid administration. A large bore catheter, 18 gauge, is advisable as this facilitates administration of large quantities of fluids. If the reaction is a response to an allergen given via the IV route, the site selected for this IV should be in the opposite arm. To supplement fluid loss and support the circulatory system, IV fluids such as lactated ringer solution, normal saline, or plasma expanders are administered. Often a liter of fluid is given over a very short time, less than an hour. Vital signs must be monitored continuously to observe for problems related to hypovolemia. If assessment indicates persistent bronchospasm, a smooth muscle relaxing drug such as aminophilin may be ordered. This must be given in a separate IV line because it is very alkaline and can cause interactions with other medications. Aminophilin is usually administered with a loading dose given slowly over a period of 15 to 30 minutes, followed by a constant infusion. Antihistamines such as diphenhydramine, Benadryl, given orally or intravenously, may also be useful to treat itching and rash. The dosage should range between 25 to 100 milligrams. Steroid medications such as hydrocortisone, solucortef, are also used. It is believed that by reducing the activity of the immune system, steroids are helpful in preventing exacerbation of symptoms several hours after the initial event. It is important throughout this crisis period to take measures to reduce the physical and emotional stress of the patient. The patient needs to be reassured that the situation is under control and a positive outcome is expected. To summarize, initial therapy for an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction includes maintaining a patent airway with equipment as needed. Administering drugs such as epinephrine, aminophilin, antihistamines, and steroids. And infusing large volumes of intravenous fluids to replace the fluid shift into the tissues. The treatment given often reverses the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, but Mrs. Harper continues to experience serious hypotension and is transferred to the intensive care unit for further treatment and continuous monitoring. In the intensive care unit, a Swan-Gans catheter is inserted to monitor Mrs. Harper for fluid volume problems. She is also maintained on automatic blood pressure monitoring. 
Cardiac monitoring is also used to alert the staff to the presence of dysrhythmias that can result from the anaphylaxis itself or from the drug therapy used in its treatment. An indwelling urinary catheter is also in place so that hourly urine volumes can be measured. This record will give an indication of the patient's cardiac output. If the patient's cardiac output falls below the desired level as determined by the patient's blood pressure and urinary output, dopamine may be given intravenously. The dopamine is started at a low dose range, less than 5 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per minute, and is titrated upward to achieve a systolic blood pressure of at least 80 millimeters. Within a few hours, Mrs. Harper's blood pressure returns to an acceptable level. Her urine output is greater than 30 cc's per hour, and her breathing is stabilized. Nevertheless, the ICU staff, with the help of the monitors, constantly observes her for signs and symptoms of recurrence of shock or other serious complications. Such complications include irreversible vascular collapse, cardiac arrest, adult respiratory distress syndrome, renal failure, and disseminated intravascular coagulation. The immediacy and continuing urgency of interventions reflects the seriousness of an anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction. Its symptoms develop quickly, and death can occur within minutes if early signs are not recognized and treated. Thus, health care givers must take steps to prevent its occurrence. To help prevent a reaction to a drug, the nurse needs to include in a patient's initial history any allergic reactions experienced in the past. Persons with a history of bronchial asthma seem to be especially sensitive to many substances. The patient should also be checked for any medical alert bracelet or tag. Extreme care must be taken before giving drugs known to trigger anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reactions. The patient should be asked about any previous use of the drug to be given. If the patient reports any past rashes or suspect reactions, the physician must be notified as it may be possible either to use an alternate drug or to give the drug in an oral form. In general, oral medications are less likely to stimulate IgE antibody production. Thus, they are less likely than parenteral drugs to provoke an acute systemic reaction. Administration routes that are rapid and direct stimulate more severe responses. If the caregiver is unfamiliar with a drug or unsure of its contents, the product insert, a drug formulary, or a pharmacist should be consulted. When parenteral drugs with a high risk potential must be given, they should be administered slowly and the patient observed carefully for at least 20 minutes following administration. The patient and family members should be taught the signs and symptoms of adverse reactions. They should also be taught to consult with a health care professional before taking additional doses of any drug suspected of causing the adverse symptoms. Medical alert bracelets or neck tags should be worn by anyone with a known sensitivity. They alert caregivers and others to the possibility of a severe reaction if the person is exposed to an antigen. Persons with known insect venom sensitivity require even more specialized teaching. They need to be instructed in both the prevention of insect stings and the actions to take should one occur. To prevent another bite, avoid areas with flowers and blossoming plants and trees, and don't wear brightly colored clothes or flowery scents. If bees are in the area, use insect repellent. The patient must also be taught emergency care measures. For example, if a person is stung, the first thing to do is to try to remove the stinger carefully by scraping. Care must be used to prevent squeezing more venom into the tissue. Insect sting anaphylaxis kits are available and can be obtained with a prescription at a pharmacy. The patient should be encouraged to purchase one. Most kits contain a tourniquet, a syringe of epinephrine, alcohol swabs, and an oral antihistamine. The patient should be shown how to apply the tourniquet to reduce blood flow from the area of the sting and thus slow the circulation of the venom to the heart. He will also need to practice giving himself an injection. He should also be advised to apply ice to the area to reduce pain and swelling. And finally, the patient must understand the need to receive prompt medical attention as some reactions may require more than just first aid measures. Teaching high-risk persons preventive and first aid measures can reduce the possibility of anaphylactic shock and can help reduce fatalities. As nurses become skilled in identifying and caring for the person experiencing an anaphylactic reaction, patient outcomes will improve. 
a person need not die from this life-threatening experience. Apply the information presented in this program to the care of the following individuals. Jason Nelson, a football player, is brought into the emergency department with a possible fractured humerus. He is in intense pain, and the physician has ordered Demerol intravenously to relieve the pain prior to having x-rays taken. What three questions should the nurse ask the patient before administering the drug? The nurse asks the patient, have you ever had asthma, hay fever, rashes, or other allergic reactions? Have you ever had an injection of Demerol, a drug I'm about to give you? If so, have you ever had a rash or problem with it? The patient responds that he had Demerol when he dislocated his knee in a football accident last year, and shortly thereafter had chills, felt hot all over, and developed a rash. What does the nurse do now? The nursing actions at this time are to inform the physician of the past reaction, obtain a substitute drug order if indicated, place an allergy sticker on the patient's armband and on his chart, and encourage the patient to obtain a medical alert bracelet. Tammy Evans, age 8, is brought to the clinic by her mother. Tammy had been playing in the yard barefoot and was stung on the foot by an insect neither she or her mother saw. The mother is very concerned because the child's father has a severe sensitivity to honeybee stings. Her mother is sure Tammy will have a serious reaction and wants the nurse to give the child an injection. Upon examination, the sting site is very red and edematous and appears to be painful. No stinger is seen. What should the nurse do while awaiting the arrival of the physician? Initial nursing actions are to explore the child's allergic history, treat the sting locally with ice, and elevate the site, reassure the patient and the mother, observe for systemic signs of reaction such as breathing difficulties, and have emergency drugs such as epinephrine available for use if needed. This concludes the program on caring for a patient who is experiencing an anaphylactic reaction.